to the church that meets here in Malden. We're so glad you all took time out of your day to come worship our Lord and Savior uh, in spirit and in truth. We have just a few announcements before we get started with our worship service this morning. If you do not have a bulletin, they are located on the foyer as you leave the auditorium on the left. Please get you one. We're very low on our number this on this week. We have several that are out traveling and even more than that, that are out sick. Uh, if you are visiting with us today, we would like you to know that you are our honored guest, and we would like to welcome you, and thank you for attending our services with us today, and we'd like for you to complete an attendance card so that we may have a, a record of your visit. You may find that attendance card in the pew, uh, in the front, in front of you as you're sitting there. We'd like to remind everyone that we are having our Veterans Day uh, luncheon. We will be honoring our veterans next Sunday. So please mark that on your calendar. Uh, that will be a great event. And the more we have, the, the better it will be. I'd also like to remind each and every one that uh, Election Day will be on Tuesday. Please don't forget to vote. We'd also like to extend our deepest condolences to the family and friends of, of Al Cox. He's from the North Charleston Church of Christ. He was very active uh, at the pop. Metal Bible Camp uh, during junior week. Um, his memorial service was uh, yesterday, November 5th. So let's keep the Cox family uh, in our prayers if we could. Some of our some of our members who, who are out traveling, we've got uh, 
we've got Greg and Kayla and Kip and Leanne and the boys who are enjoying a week in Gatlinburg, so let's keep them in our prayers. Don't know if they will make it home in time for this evening's service, probably not. I think they're at the park today. Um, once again, several of our members are, are out sick. Uh, we've got Rusty and Katie. Um, Austin is also home with Miss Vicki, so Rusty and Katie could get a break this, this morning. Ray and Ashley are also uh, out with, sick with, uh, with Blake as well. Alice is not with us today. She has a, a pulled muscle in her neck and back, so let's keep her in our prayers for sure. And we'd also like to welcome Joel Maddox back. We missed you last week, Joel. Glad you're here. In this morning's worship service, uh, Brother Joel Foster will be leading us in our song service. Our scripture reading will be by Brother Dennis. Our lesson will also be by Brother Dennis Strine. Our closing prayer will be by uh, Brother Joe Mormon. And if you would bow with me, we will start our service this morning in opening prayer. Almighty God and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the great and holy name. Dear Lord, what an honor and a privilege it is to be able to approach your throne this morning in prayer. Praise your hallowed and holy name. Giving you thanks, Father, for the wonderful many blessings of life that you bestow upon us in this beautiful Lord's Day you've given us, this opportunity we have to gather here with our Christian brothers and sisters to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, to sing songs of praises unto thee, to gather around thy table to remember the great sacrifice given to us by Jesus, and to open and hear another portion of your true and divine word. So thankful, Father, for your church that meets here in Malden and in your church the world over. We pray, Father, that the truth will always be taught in your church. Thankful, Father, this morning for, for Brother Dennis, and we pray that he might have a ready recollection of, of what he has put together for us this morning, what he has studied. We pray that he will be able to deliver his lesson this morning to a way, in a way that we may be able to, to understand what we're hearing, that we may be able to apply it to our lives to continue to be the Christians you expect us to be. Dear Lord, we just pray that as your children that we would continue to grow in love and understanding of one another and of thy word. So thank you, Father, this morning for Brother Joel as he performs our song service. We just pray this morning, Father, that we would all lift our voices up to thee, that you would find our singing according to your will pleasing to you in your sight. We pray, Father, this morning for each and every one who has made the journey out here to this worship service, each member that is here, and family that is represented. We pray for your blessings on each and every one of them. We pray, Father, for those of our number who are unable to be here, those who, that who are out sick. There's many of them, Lord. We, we tried to mention some, but there are, there's many more. We just pray, Father, that you would lay your healing hand on them and here worship with us uh, soon that they would regain their health. We pray, Father, for those that may be working, those that are traveling this morning, Father, we pray that they would have a safe journey home. And we also pray, Father, this morning for the, those who may be spiritually sick this morning, we pray that something may be said or done in their life so that they would change the air of their ways and come to your fold, Father, before it is eternally too late. Thankful again, Father, for your word and the truth that we can find in it. We just pray that as we continue with this worship service this morning, that all that is said and done is according to your will and pleasing in your sight. And we just pray, Father, this time that you forgive us when we fall short of being the Christians you expect us to be. And this prayer we ask this morning is in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Brother George. <laughs> One, five, three. One, five, three. Oh! 
As we gather around the table this morning, we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' body and his blood that was shed upon that cruel cross for each and every one of us. And he done this in remembrance of him. I'm going to read Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. That's Luke 22, 14 through 20. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat, therefore until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. 
For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave them gave unto them, saying, this, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. We'll now have a prayer for our bread. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we gather around that table to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the first day of the week as your word commands us, we're thankful for this bread which represents the body of Christ. And as Christians, as we partake of it, we pray that we'll do so in a manner well-pleasing unto thee. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Now continue in prayer for the food of the vine. Let's pray. Dear Father, the morning feast this morning coming to us through the word. Took the uh, cup, the blood shed, that cross of Calvary, took the food of the vine, this right here, when that day, crucified, crucified that Calvary. And this is our little bit of thee. This is for us. Amen.
That concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is given back to the Lord as he's prospered and gave unto us. If you would, I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 9, <coughs> verses 7, and it reads, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. We'll now have a prayer for the offering. Our God, Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this offering we have to give back a portion of what God's given unto us. Let us all do this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Five, seven, one. Five, seven, one. <clears throat> Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray, come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master seeking to name, going afar. Never. 
Calvary, He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back to me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glorious to see him on that day? I then will sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Our hymn of encouragement, 272. 272. Before Brother Dennis comes and speaks to us, 622. 622. If it's convenient, we ask you to stand. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth.
Our scripture reading this morning will be from Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and starting with verse 57 and reading to the end of the chapter. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury his own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my house. And Jesus said, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's just suppose for a moment that there is a sign on your front porch and that sign reads, Jesus is an unseen guest in this house. Would that sign be a true reflection of life in your home? Or would that sign be there just to look good and to have a good message. How much better would it be if that sign hung over our hearts? You know, it does little good to hang out this sign if Jesus is really not a guest in our hearts. In verse 58 that we read in Luke chapter 9, where Jesus said, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And we need to think about just that verse for just a moment. Jesus resided in heaven. Jesus lived in a place where there was peace and joy. Jesus lived where he was on an equal footing with God. And it was something that belonged to him. But then Jesus, he stepped out of eternity, gave up that home for no home. During the time of Jesus' ministry on this earth, there were a lot of folks that took him into their homes. Now you might be wondering where I'm going to go with that this morning, but this morning we're going to go with Jesus into some of those homes and we're going to look at what difference his presence made in those homes. Just what will happen if we ourselves give Jesus a home, allow him to be that unseen guest in our homes, in our hearts, and just what would that do for us? We're going to first go to Luke chapter 4. Simon's house. Verses 36 through 40. When we read the text here, Jesus had a very busy day. He were in Capernaum. He had been teaching in the synagogue. Verse 36 tells us that the people were astonished and amazed at his teachings. That Jesus, he spoke with authority and power, and even the unclean spirits obeyed him. And we find there in verse 37 that Jesus' abilities, those works, those miracles, they were spreading throughout the area. Jesus was quickly becoming a rather notable public figure. But the day is winding down. So Jesus, he goes to Simon's house. Now this was Peter, Simon Peter, before Jesus actually gave him the name Peter, so you'll know who we're talking about. Now, verse 38 tells us that Simon's mother was mother-in-law was extremely ill. Scriptures say high fever or great fever. And Matthew and Mark, Luke, they all mention 
fever, but Luke, he was a physician. He was the only one that said it was a high or a great fever. And the medical practice of that day divided fevers into two types, high and low, major and minor. Peter's mother-in-law was gravely ill. And they appealed to Jesus for help. And he responded immediately to her need and healed her. Verse 39 tells us that she immediately got up and began to serve her. We have three points in here that we can make if we take Jesus home with us. The first one is that Jesus is always ready to serve. Even when he went through that very busy day, he was ready to serve. You can imagine how tired he was. He needed some rest. Probably hasn't eaten all day, so he was probably very hungry. He had to have his energy restored. He was, after all, God in the flesh. The body still needed rest and sustenance. But when there was a cry for help, he put aside his own needs to serve someone else. The point is that he is also ready to serve in our homes, in our lives. There is no limit to his willingness, but the question remains, do we want him in our lives? Second, he can heal any problem doesn't matter if it's great or small. He does not have a shortage of power. Where the shortage comes in is our willingness to allow him access in our lives. Regardless of what we face, regardless of our problems, whether it is physical or whether it is spiritual, he has the power to take care of our problems. And if our physical infirmities are not healed in answer to our prayers, he will definitely help us to cope and find comfort. But we must, by faith, believe this. And the other thing we notice here is that there is no partial healing. You know, when we run a high fever, we get sick, we take some Tylenol, we take some aspirin or something, it reduces the fever, uh, but we're still sick. And we still won't, don't want, really want to do anything. But here, Jesus was completely healing his mother-in-law. Regardless of what problems we have in our, our lives, regardless of if it's physical or spiritual, he has the power to take care of our problems. You know, Jesus could have left her in a somewhat less weakened condition. But there was a complete submission here. There was a complete cure. And you kind of have to wonder why some are still having problems when they've turned them over to God. Could it be sometimes like when we're really sick and the doctor gives us an antibiotic and we start feeling better, so we stop taking it? Oftentimes we turn things over to God and we start feeling better and we withdraw our submissiveness. We take it back out of his hands. And that's something we mustn't do. If we're facing physical problems, it's not a sign of a lack of faith. But the Bible teaches us to trust God to take care of us. God does it for the animal kingdom. He does it for the plant kingdom. In the Beatitudes, it says that he cares for the birds of the air. 
that he cares for the flowers of the field. So we must understand that Jesus, his presence in our lives will bring us the same provisions and healing. We just take our problems to him and leave them with him and be confident that he's going to take care of it for us. That he's going to do what is best for us. You know, sometimes when we pray for a loved one who's, who's extremely ill and we want them to get better and they never get better, and we say, well, God's not looking out after me. Maybe God is answering the prayers, but not in the way we want. Maybe he's telling you, look, I'm giving you the opportunity to serve, to take care of, to be with someone. Why did Simon's family ask for help? Because they had faith that Jesus would bring about the healing. We need to have that kind of trust and confidence, and we need to allow it to grow in our lives. Luke chapter 5 is the next home we're going into. Levi, or as we know, Matthew, goes into his house, verses 27 through 32. It wasn't long after Jesus had left Simon's house that he sees Levi sitting at the tax table. And he calls Levi and he says, come follow me. And Luke says that Levi left everything. He got up and he followed Jesus. And in this narrative it says that Levi made a great feast for Jesus. That Greek word Mega is the same Greek word that Luke used to describe Peter's mother-in-law's fever. Great. So this wasn't just some food thrown together. It wasn't just a few people. There were lots of people there. And guess who shows up? The Pharisees and their little scribes hanging back behind them. They questioned the disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus hears them. He answers them. Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. And I don't come here to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. What else can we expect if Jesus is that unseen guest in our hearts? First, I will notice that Jesus calls the unlikely and the unexpected. There was not a single Jew who had tried to evangelize Levi. Not a single one. Sinners that have a ripe heart for change are all around us today. But we have to be careful. See, sometimes we prejudge, and when we prejudge, and we reevaluate our prospect list until almost no one can be saved. And like the Pharisees, we give up on many before we ever start. But if we allow Jesus to come completely into our lives, any and everyone becomes a prospect for salvation, not just those that are in our social circles. Jesus, if he is an unseen guest in our hearts, will make evangelism a part of our lives, not a method. The other thing that we find here is that Levi left everything. This is the true cost of discipleship. Nothing counts. Nothing matters if we miss Christ. 
Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. We sing it, but do we mean it? The other disciples, Peter, James, John, all of these guys, they could have at any time returned to their jobs as fishermen or whatever. It wouldn't have been hard to do. Just walk away. Go back to doing what you're doing, what you've always done. But to them all, there was total commitment. When Jesus made his home in their hearts, they were never the same ever again. Ever. Friends, God will not accept any robberies. He never has. He never will. No other gods before me. Love me with all your your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul. And Jesus is that unseen guest in our hearts. Total commitment comes with him. When we sin, it is forgiven with confession, admission, and acknowledgement. When we fail to do these things, we inhibit his forgiveness. We block it. And until we admit these things, Jesus can't heal us. And as long as we live, or if we are living in self-righteousness, like the Pharisees did, we will be blind to that saving grace that Christ gives. Jesus changes course in Luke chapter 7. Just a little bit. Verses 36 through verse 50. Jesus goes to another house. Simon the Pharisee. And yes, Jesus was invited. I guess when you have someone who has attracted all the attention that Jesus has, somebody's going to want him in the house. Get that celebrity in here. You could say, I guess, that this was an elite gathering. But Jesus was no respecters of persons he was going to go because every place that Jesus went, he taught. He dined with tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, he dined with the Pharisees too. And there he is, he's reclining at the Pharisees' table. And while they're reclining, a lady had come in. And she began to wet Jesus' feet with her tears. She was wiping them with her hair, and then she poured ointment on his feet. And Simon, sitting there, thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this was, who was touching him, for she is a sinner. Let me ask you a question. How many of us would like to sit down at a table with someone who can read your mind? You know that little sign on your front porch? Jesus is the unseen guest here. Think about that for a moment too. Jesus responded to his thought with a parable. And after the parable, Jesus said to him, I came into your house. You gave me no water to wash my feet. She washed my feet with her tears and hair. You didn't give me that customary welcome with a kiss. Yet she constantly kissed my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she poured this expensive ointment on my feet. Hair it hurt. Him. He turns to that woman and he says something that I'm sure every jaw dropped at that house. <clears throat> Your sins are forgiven. Friends, the points that this poem is making is that one, our relationship with God is based on on our practicing our faith, not just preaching it. 
Was Simon's theology correct? Yes, it was. But he didn't practice it. James, in James 2 and verse 17, he tells us that faith that does not lead to practicing what we preach is dead. It's a dead faith. A religion that pleases God is more than being able to quote a bunch of Bible verses. It's more than just attending services or, or telling others what, what they should believe and how they're to live. True religion is going out and doing it ourselves. I have no idea truly why Simon why Simon didn't act according to the custom of the day. But there, there could be just maybe an explanation. You know, the Greeks majored in academics. They were highly intelligent. They were philosophical. They were always exploring things. They prided themselves in knowing more and more truth. But rather than practicing what they learned, they learned too much. It made them mad. James in James 1 verse 22 tells us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. You see, we can learn everything we need to know in the Bible, but we must be able to practice it if we are going to have that relationship with God. We need to search the scriptures every day. But then we need to practice those things that we have read and studied. Friend, biblical knowledge is for living. It must be life-changing. I said this morning in Bible class, if, if we're reading our Bibles every day but we're not practicing it, we may as well be reading a John Grisham novel over and over again. Biblical knowledge is what we need to make our hearts, his heart, his heart, our hearts. And it prepares us to allow him to be that guest that resides there. Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is there. Mary is sitting there listening to Jesus as he's teaching and Martha's running around like a chicken with her head cut off, waiting and serving everyone. How many times we're we sitting around and we've got something big and we're the only ones doing all the work and we wish someone else would get up and give us a hand? But what the other people are doing are as important, but we feel that sometimes what we're doing is the most important. What Mary, Martha was doing was important, but not as important as what Mary was doing. You see, when we allow Jesus to be a guest in our hearts, we allow him to set our priorities. Martha made a good choice, but Mary made a better choice. And we can be sure that our lives will be changed when Jesus is a guest there and we have him as our unseen guest. I mean, will tell us that material things are no longer important, that our earthly pursuits no longer fuel our ambitions. And keeping up with the neighbors will be frivolous. <clears throat> Sitting at the feet of Christ should be our first and foremost priority. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus is going in a triumphal air, uh, entrance into Jericho. Luke 19, the first 10 verses. The streets are crowded. Jesus is going in. There's a, a little man by the name of Zacchaeus. He's trying to see Jesus, he can't because the crowds are in front of him, he was really short. So he runs ahead of Jesus and the procession and he ends up climbing, the Bible says, a sycamore tree. And as Jesus gets to that tree, 
Jesus looks up and said, Zacchaeus, come down. We're going to go to your house. People were upset. They were mumbling and grumbling. This guy's a tax collector. That's disgusting to go to his house. But Zacchaeus answers that crowd. And Jesus, in verse 8, if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Just prior to that, he said that he gives half of his goods to the poor. I'm sure that there are some folks there in Jericho and the surrounding area that look at Zacchaeus as a good man. Friends, this is a New Testament example of genuine repentance. Retribution is negated by God when we make restitution. When we ask for forgiveness, when we give back. And Jesus, in response to what Zacchaeus said, Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Salvation, initially, when we're baptized and ongoing, occurs with genuine repentance. We will not get to heaven without it. We have one more. One more. This one is on the road to Emmaus. This is in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Two men had left this resurrection day going home to Emmaus. And these were two men who did not know of the resurrection of Jesus. And then Jesus joins these two on the way home, but Jesus' identity is hidden from them. And while they are probably seeing someone there, it is not recognizable to, Jesus, to them. But they visit. And we can see their problems in these verses. Their, their problems, they have, they have doubt, they have fear, there's frustration, there's disillusionment. I, I followed this man and now he's gone. He told me he was to be starting his kingdom where is it they just killed him on a cross and buried him there goes my hope there goes my dream there is a loss to these two men of the presence of Christ in their lives verse 29 it says that they invited Jesus into their home for supper and it was that time that they were sitting around the table and that Jesus revealed himself to them. And in doing so, Jesus restored and rekindled their hope. Jesus gave them back the life as it ought to be. And Jesus is just as willing and ready and able to do that for us too if we let him in if we let him be that unseen guest in our homes especially in our hearts Jesus wants to live with us he truly does he does not want any of us to live alone and we never will be alone if we allow him to be that unseen guest if you're not a child of God today, invite Jesus into your heart. Make this commitment to you. Make this commitment to him. That you'll give up this life that you're leaving and decide this day to live for him. You can become that child of God. You can become a part of God's family through repentance and confession and New Testament baptism for the remission of your sins. You obey these things this day. You will become that child of God, that adopted child whose hope and eternity is, is sealed for good. If anyone has a need this evening, would you come as together we stand and we sing? <coughs>
session, our annual planning session, that will be at 7 on Friday evening. We hope you have a good week, and like I say, we hope that we'll see you again this evening. This time, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm very thankful to you this day for everything you bless us with. We're always thankful for our homes and our families. We thank you for the church that's able to meet here today. <coughs> we praise your name through songs and praise. Heavenly Father, we pray for all our number who are not well today, who are sick and not able to be with us. We always pray, especially for Sue Dills and for Teen and for uh, Ruth and Deborah and Rick. If they're not able to be with us today, we pray that you'll be with them that they struggle with illness and, and calamities that plague their lives every day. We pray for Deborah this week that she'll have a procedure done that she'll be successful and she will be able to gain strength again. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for everyone who's not able to be here this morning because of travel and so forth. We pray for the travelers to be safe on their trips and return safely to us once again. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation today. We know that we will have an election this week and uh, we, will, we will seek new followers, seek new leaders to follow our country. We pray for our, for our nation, Heavenly Father, that we'll do things more acceptable in your sight. Heavenly Father, we, we are thankful every day for everything you bless us with. We, we, we want to be better Christians and be, seek your lives every day. We pray that you be with us now and we be, take this lesson to our hearts today. We pray that we might, we might be stronger Christians and be good examples to those around us lead us to Jesus Christ and salvation. We pray all I see you, Heavenly Father, in a strong and loving name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray it. Amen. Amen. Amen.